How's it going, folks? Matt McQueenie, Mix Minus Podcast. Sunday, May 6th, 1.45 p.m. Oh, the weather's getting nice, even though it's a little overcast today. There were some days this week that hit 90 in certain parts of the vicinity where we are. And usually when it hits 90, I'm just as angry about things as it is when it's snowing 9 inches or 12 inches. But for whatever reason, the end of this last winter has been so brutal that I'll take 90 and I feel really, really good about it. So we're hitting our stride. Everything's nice. The big problem is the New York Mets, though. Um, The last time I spoke, there was some discontent with Matt Harvey and his performance, and he did end up getting moved to the bullpen, and he flamed out there just as quickly as he flamed out this year as a starter, and the Mets sadly designated him for assignment on Friday, and the Matt Harvey era is over. Um, It lasted about five or six years. He took took on the scene of New York and got his monikers and nicknames and just really gave Mets fans something to cheer about again, hope for the future um, in a young power pitching all-star who started an all-star game, basically, and he was the talk of everything. But if you don't have it anymore, if the production drops off, if surgery sap you of your superpower as a pitcher, then you're uh, you're out of the league at 29 years old. He will get a shot, I'm sure, but he's going to have to want to um, go to the minors and find himself. He did not want to do that here with the Mets. They gave him the opportunity to, to go down to the minors and to try to come back. And let's be honest, there have been some guys who have done that who have gone on to be Hall of Fame pitchers. Roy Holiday famously did it. Um, uh, Cliff Lee did it. Even for the Mets, you remember when Steve Traxel did it. I mean, he was not of the caliber of these pitchers, but he went down. And didn't he actually have a 20-win season at some point after that? It was the only thing the Mets had going for them in that year when he got that. But people go down, and it's really the only place where you can go get away from the limelight and just pitch and try things and, and find the core capabilities that will push you ahead as a pitcher in the league. And uh, you're you're not doing it against major league hitters. You're doing it against... Um, aspiring major league hitters, but it's quieter. You're not in front of 40, 50,000 people. And it just gives you the chance to regroup, resettle and find something and then come back with uh, the wind behind your back. But he didn't want to do that. Uh, I can't blame him necessarily. He had the option to say no and he did. And the Matt Harvey error is done. Who would have ever thought that would happen? But the Mets as hot as they started, it's been just as cold on the other end. They're only about three games over 500 at this point. They're playing Colorado today. They're up two to one in the second inning right now. Who knows if that will stick? Noah Syndergaard is on the mound, and he really should be the shutdown artist here, Um, but we'll see. Uh, It's been When things go bad, they go bad in baseball, and they just cascade to the point where it's just terrible, and you just can't buy a win, and you can't stop the bleeding. And I'll tell you what, uh, living and watching in the same city, having two major league baseball teams, and one of them being the Yankees, um, if there was not a second team, there's a losing streak, whatever, you don't have something to benchmark it against. But then you, you have the Yankees who started off a little quietly and then have just become world beaters. I think they're 10 or more games over 500 already. So when the Mets are dipping and then the Yankees are ascending, it's just that old Marsha, Marsha, Marsha feeling for Mets fans against the Yankees. And the Yankees always seem to have everything figured out. The uh, the Yankees always seem to have their shelves full with players and players coming up and in the minors. And the only thing they don't really have, I think, are pitchers. It's really duct taped together. I guess Severino's a high-level pitcher. They have the bullpen. But the other pitchers, they don't scare me. But the lineup is great. It's got youth. They can potentially find a pitcher. Boy, wouldn't it be something if they go and get Matt Harvey and rehabilitate him into a top-level pitcher. Um, That would be the ultimate uh, shiv in the back to the Mets fans. Um, But I would like to see Matt Harvey find himself. I would like to see him find some success. All he ever wanted was the payday. And sometimes when you fight to get that payday, you don't get it. 
because that's all you're focused on. You're just focused on finding that payday as opposed to uh, focusing on each pitch and focusing on your preparation and the five days in between starts, getting yourself right, preparing for that next lineup that you're going to have to face and getting yourself through that game and focusing on each inning and each batter and each pitch. Um, And he was focused on something more. I can't blame him. He was on the precipice of being a $100 million pitcher or more, and he is not going to find that unless he has – Um, a revolutionary turnaround here. We're not talking evolution. We're talking revolution. He has to have a staggering turnaround, something that you would not expect. And that part is sad because you're thinking about all that earning power and it's uh, kibosh. I mean, he was making something like five and a half million this year. I think he might've made four last year. So he did start to get some millions. It wasn't like where the Mets pitchers were several years ago where they were all making maybe at most a half a million dollars, which to you or I, great money, but to a major league baseball player and a pitcher who um, who are always on the precipice of that that Tommy John surgery and being out for a year and never knowing if you could come back, or you know all of your fortunes being on your arm and staying healthy and keeping the that couple of miles an hour more that you need to create the distance between pitches. It's a scary proposition, and he did not get there. We'll see if these other Mets pitchers get there in Cindergarten to Grom. And they've pitched pretty okay, but the Mets just have to find a way. Just as things have gone down as badly as they have, they just they can find the way and turn the corner and then start a streak as well. When things are bad, they look bad, and when they're bad while the Yankees are going good or going well, it's especially bad because you can just, I mean, when the Mets started, Yank, um, you know, as hot as they did, the Mets fans were like, oh, look at us, look at the, against the Yankees. They're 12-2 and two or whatever, 13-2, and two, and um, now they're only three games over 500. So it really all goes wrong quickly, and it can all turn around quickly as well. We are only at the beginning of May. There is still May, June, July, August, September, hopefully October. We could be in mid-September looking at this, period where the Mets went downhill after the early start as just a blip, or we could see it as the ultimate trend towards a downward team. And it's just hilarious when I think back to Vegas and looking at that 81 win over under and saying the last podcast, boy, this is why I was just so um, uh, bullish on the Mets crossing over that 81 win mark with ease, because look at what this team can do. But Vegas knows because look what they can do on the other end too. Um, just as they can win, they can lose. And winning and losing cascade in equal measures. So um, we'll see what happens. But, man, watching those Yankees do what they do, all of a sudden I'm uh, each night not necessarily dying to watch the Mets. I haven't used my DVR function on the YouTube TV to start the games from the beginning. I come down and I often just go right to the live point at 830 when you're five or six innings in. And the Mets are usually down three to one, four to one, four to nothing. Uh, they're they're uh, they're typically down. So we'll see where they we'll see how they come out of this because they need to. They have enough players and they have enough players on offense and they have enough guys who just have to play to the back of the baseball card if those things still exist or play to the ESPN statistics. And one of my favorite things with the ESPN statistics, by the way, I love the projected stats. I think you can only get it on the desktop version and not even on the app and not on mobile, but I love looking at projected stats, especially this early into a season where a guy is on a tear and someone might have 10 home runs at this point and you don't know what 10 10 home runs really means. You don't understand what the dominance of that is, but then when you look at the projected stats and you see he'd be on track for 80 home runs, you go, oh, okay. But I really like those projected stats because they make you... um, more excited about where the numbers are right now. Batting average, on-base percentage, slugging, those are all kind of constants in a way. You understand what those mean because they're averages, but totals, those are the things I love for projected stats. I love seeing if a guy's on track to get to 100 RBIs, if he's on track to get to 30 home runs, if he's on track to get to 100 runs. It's just a lot of fun. With wins, if he's on track to get to 17, 18, God forbid, 20 wins. Just my favorite thing. I might start doing a segment, projected stats, and just call out a couple of players and uh, and and see where they're headed from around the league. An update on the flying squirrel situation. Everybody remembers. Well, if I could be so vain, and everybody heard that episode, I talked about my critters in the attic in the form of flying squirrels, which are almost bat 
squirrel hybrids, except they're tiny. And they like to be in trees and then in the evening time, jump from trees to ha- to the tops of houses and then burrow themselves and their families and then build their families, much as I'm trying to build my nesting family here in my home in the in the below three floors of the home, if I count the finished attic, they want to build their families in that attic area. And uh, we had this, I wouldn't call it an infestation, but we had flying squirrels at a level that was precarious and at a level that needed to be handled. So we ended up having to pay for this. Uh, it was not covered in our normal um, exterminator yearly fee or subscription fee for extermination. And I do have to say that's a good fee. If you have to pay it, it's a couple hundred dollars. And these people will come out, I was going to say these guys, but not to be sexist, but I have not seen a woman come through as an exterminator yet. They're all guys. As my nanny says, they all kind of look like the critters that they are going after. They kind of have those uh, rodenty looks, not <laughs> not saying badly. I appreciate these guys. I love talking with them. But uh, these folks do come through. They come through whenever you call and they are ready to go at any time. The customer service in the extermination industry is at a level that I think even Apple would uh, would would envy. And so they come through and they said, on this one, you got flying squirrels. The guy, as I said, went upstairs into that attic that I never go into anymore. The minute I knew there was stuff up there, I used to keep luggage up there. I'd keep stuff up. The minute I knew there was animal action happening up there, I always, you know, you know I'm very naive. I always thought that the attic was closed off, but the attic is something that these critters, mice, not necessarily squirrels. They need a bigger birth entry. Um, mice, uh, the uh, flying squirrels, because they're kind of the size, if not smaller than mice, they can get in there with relative ease. And this guy went up there and he came right back down because he said, oh my God, I saw one. I saw a flying squirrel. And as he said, as I noted, he said in that last episode, one flying squirrel usually means there's five or six that you don't see. And so he saw one. He usually doesn't. I mean, I'm not going to quite say it's the um, Bigfoot sighting, but he doesn't see them very often. And he did see one. And uh, he said, you're going to have to get this handled. You're, we're going to have to come out, which they ended up doing. They're going to have to put a one-way access point so the flying squirrels can leave when they go out to get their children or the juveniles, as the uh, one uh, exterminator said, they go out to get food, bring it back to the juveniles, um, as I do for my family as well. If I go out and get the pizza, if I go out and get the Mexican food, and uh, once they go out, they cannot get back in. And it almost looks like there's this huge slinky thing on the outside of your house sticking out, like a slinky um, satellite in a way. And so this thing allows them to get out the slinky and then they can't get back in. And it did look ridiculous, this slinky thing. But once they are sure that these things are gone, they then go and take the slinky thing away and then they plug the hole up that they would get in and then you're home free. So these, uh, gentlemen showed up on the one day that my nanny was here and she said that they came in with these pretty solid sized cages and they went up there with peanut butter And they set up about eight cages around the attic, and that was that. So I'm thinking, okay, we're in good shape. We're on a good path here. Then that night or the night after that they came, I started hearing what sounded like people breaking into my attic. It literally sounded like adults breaking into my attic. sounded like things are being bashed up there. It sounded really scary and uh, something I wasn't planning. No one told us this could happen. Of course, once you bring it up, they all say, oh, yeah, yeah, of course it happens. But it was really loud. And my wife and I are very quiet at night because we're very uh, cognizant of our son sleeping on the second floor. We've almost taught him to expect complete silence in a home where my wife and I will actually eat our dinner in the dining room most nights because it's the furthest point away in the house from him. We'll have the iPad set up as our TV and we'll eat in the dining room, not with formal stuff, but we'll eat there. So... Noises are something that we keep to a minimum, and uh, we even will watch television on the Apple TV, for instance, or on the Roku, and we'll have headphones on when we're watching television. We all are a little weird in certain ways. That's how we're weird. We are complete silence. When people stay at our house to watch our son, such as my mom, or sometimes our nanny has been there late, you'll come home, and these folks are blasting television, and my son is sleeping still. 
Uh, or you'll see with your nanny that uh, in our case, we tend to leave his door open to go to bed. He says door on the wall. It's like a hostage negotiation. As I say, negotiating with toddlerists, um, it's a negotiation. You cannot close the door until he's asleep. And it's got to be when he's sound asleep because he has a little trigger in his mind. If he starts seeing that door close and he's in REM, he jumps right up and he goes, keep it on the wall. So you go, okay, we'll keep it on the wall. But even in the point where our nanny and we'll watch it on our little video on our Nest Cam. She will go, nope, we're closing the door. And then he goes, okay. So to each their own, everybody's got their own situations with certain individuals, but she's able to do that. They're all able to blast TV to a degree and he sleeps. But for us, we're convinced he won't sleep. So we need complete silence in our home. It is almost like a monk's residence in the evening, Trappist monks. So we're sitting there the one night and... I actually went out to the fridge in the garage. We have a fridge in our garage, a second fridge, where I keep a lot of my beer, and sometimes we keep our food overflow. And I went out there, and I saw a little critter run across the garage. I've never seen something in my garage. I've never seen a mouse in my garage. I've never seen a chipmunk. Certainly never seen a mouse. My wife says she's seen a mouse at some point, and we took care of it. I don't remember that. But as a man, I don't remember anything, apparently. But I do know I've never seen one in there. So I see this thing run across, And you're really kind of primed about this whole critter situation because you got the attic thing going on. You got uh, your mind is attuned to mice and flying squirrels and all this that now I saw one run across the garage and I said, they're about to take our house over. They're obviously planning their attack. They're going to get into the impregnable uh, area of the home in the three floors, including the finished basement that we live within. We've never seen anything in our house. We've had some ant situations, but we've never seen a rodent in our home. And I'm convinced now, okay, the flying squirrels in the attic. Now I got mice here. Now, granted, the mice are really just around because there was so much snow, there's nowhere to go. And if I happen to open my garage door, take the garbage out one day, that's enough time for a mouse to sneak in. Um, now we do have a lot of traps out there. But they snuck in, and uh, but I'm convinced this this thing is over. These these this is war. These rodents are coming for us in our home, and so that happened. And by the way, when I went to my garage, I saw the uh, the skeletal remains, of course, with the hair. It's it's crazy the way mice die, because there's like nothing left of them except like bony little tiny little hands and arms and then fur, and that's all that's left. I saw one in my uh, little shed out back where I keep my. Uh, riding mower. I saw it kind of belly up. (laughs) So they were looking for somewhere to go. Obviously there's so much snow. There's nowhere to go for these things. I do feel bad about that, about that, but not at the expense of my home. And so I saw this thing run across the garage and I was like, Oh my God, this is crazy. So with that in mind, I walked back inside and at first of all, I'm like, geez, now I'm going to have to worry about going out for a beer uh, to my garage. This is the ultimate in breaking my comfort zone, but I get back in the house and then we're seated on our couch after dinner. And then it sounds like, again, something is breaking into our home. It sounds like a rattling of some sort. And I first thought it was in the garage, which is right kind of on the other side of one of the walls in the living room where we sit and watch TV. And I'm thinking it's there. And I'm like, could it be that mouse I saw? This is crazy. What's going on? feels like we're under attack. And, uh, and so my wife goes, we'll go out and look. I'm like, I'm not going out and look. See, I'm a man in theory. I really am a man, but I'm not a man. I will not go out and check on things. This is why I live in a home and I have a home and I have locks and I have a security system. I'm not going out and checking on things. I don't believe in guns, so I'm not keeping a gun. I'm just going to make sure my house is locked up and I have a security system in ADP, right? And I have the sign out front. It was a funny part in Mindhunter when uh, the woman asked the guy who was the security uh, uh, person who came and set the security up. She felt like the, uh, that the security system was too expensive, but she asked if he could at least leave the sign out in front so that people thought that they had a security system, but I do all that. I don't want to go check on things. I, I don't watch horror movies. So, uh, but I know what happens in them. I don't want to go out into the darkness. I just want to stay in my home where there's light. I treat living in my home, like living on Mars. Like when I'm in that, uh, when I'm in that safe cocoon or bubble, that's where I live. That's where I stay. If I'm going to go out, it's going to be during light and I'm going to go out with a spacesuit, and it's all going to be fine in that regard. Or I'm going to go out when there's a lot of people out in the neighborhood. Bears wouldn't come around. Certain animals wouldn't come around. I am not going out at night. I don't like it. If I have to go out and get my garbage can at the bottom of the driveway and it's dark, 
I'll make a lot of noise. I'll play a podcast out loud just in case bears are afraid of WTF with Mark Marin, um, which I do hear they are. So I'm hearing this thing and she's like, well, you got to go check it out. And I'm like, I'm not checking it out. No, I'm not checking it out. And so I said, well, all right. So I opened the door to the garage. I looked in real quick, turned the light on and then closed it. And I said, there's nothing there. So we're seated and this noise just keeps just going crazy. And I got to the point where we were able to pinpoint that it was obviously coming from the attic. And I'm telling you, it sounded like what ended up, I mean, it ended up being cages banging, right? Because after we were not prepared for this, we ended up finding out that the parents left the attic through the one-way access point. And so all this night, I'm thinking that it must be the parents trying to get back into the one-way access point. It must be the sound of them trying to get back into our house because it was, it was like digging, it was metal, it was caging sounds. And it was, it was kind of um, around the attic. Like you could hear it in different positions. There was a stereo aspect to it. And, uh, and so I'm thinking it's that. And so my wife's like, well, you should go, you should go and look. And I'm like, I'm not opening in the, I'm, I'm just not going in the attic. I've already, I've already talked about the fact I'm not going into this attic ever again. I would, I would seal it up before I would go back in there. When the guys come, when the exterminators come, I'll go up then after they've gone up first. I don't want to go because I think I've told you in the past, if I pull down that thing, also worst position for a, a pull down attic to be is in your personal closet, your walk-in closet where my wife and I keep our clothes. Because when you pull that thing down, there's like the remains of mice and stuff that can fall down, the aforementioned hair and like bony uh, remnants that can come down and you don't know if they're falling into your stuff. It's gross. And it's like right into your, uh, it's right into your closet. So I was like, no, I'm not looking at it. We'll talk, the exterminators will come and it'll be fine. Just be quiet. But as I say that, it's compounding. The noise is so loud it could potentially upset our son sleeping. It's that loud. I mean, it was so loud. It sounded like someone was beating cages like in your attic. And it is deathly quiet where I live out here in Sparta. Completely quiet. Um, Just, I mean, you could hear a pin drop outside. It's so quiet. And so this thing is so loud. I mean, it's like people could probably hear it out on the street. It's so loud. And I'm like, no, they're just trying to get in. Uh, It'll be fine. And so then she goes, we're laying in bed. It's like 1030. She goes, well, maybe you should go outside and like flash a light up at the one way access point. I'm like, you have to be kidding me. That is the last thing in my life I would ever do. I'm not going outside in the pitch dark and flashing a light up there. What if I see those like beady little eyes looking at, I'm not doing that. Absolutely not. And so the only thing that would make me get away with this is if these, whatever's going on up there just stopped and shut down and it didn't. It kept going and it kept getting worse and it kept getting um, more spread out across the attic. I mean, it was not good noise. It was crazy. And it was a couple days of this just incessant banging like someone's breaking in. It was hard to do anything. We couldn't watch TV because it would just happen and you have to pretend like there's not the beating heart, you know, like Poe's poem, the beating heart and the floorboards. That's what it was like, except it was the, the beating juvenile flying squirrels in our attic. And so, um, the guy shows up a couple days later and, uh, so he shows up a couple days later and he was, he was uh, instructed to call me. So I get the call from my house phone, which means my mother-in-law was calling. And then this guy proceeds to tell me everything that's going on. And my mother-in-law is hearing this and she's getting all upset. But he said basically that the parents left, as I had said, to go get food. They couldn't get back in. The juveniles come out looking for food. They go into these cages, which were pretty solid sized cages. Apparently they go into these cages cause they see peanut butter. Uh, the snap comes down. They're stuck in these cages. And the guy goes on to say that they basically died up there. There was something like, uh, I think five or six or maybe, uh, spread across eight cages. There was a f- solid amount that were found that went in these cages because the sound had stopped at some point, which means, the flying squirrels, the baby flying squirrels had passed on. But somehow my mother-in-law um, conveys the story to my wife who calls me up a little later saddened that, well, we I didn't know that they were going to be killed, that they were going to die. It's like, um, I mean, I didn't either per se, but it's sort of, I, I, what else are you going to do? Um, 
Uh, I don't I don't know what else is going to go on if it's days after. And she was thinking that maybe they should have come the day after and take care of it. But what do you do with flying squirrels in the wild that have been uh, that have been raised in an attic and are accustomed to that kind of setup? And they're not going to be getting that set up out in the wild. It's almost like a zoo animal being left let out into the wild. They can't really there's not a lot of nature left to uh, overcome the nurture aspect. And then somehow she told my wife that their heads were cut off, which their heads were cut off. Excuse me. No, the snaps. So you're telling me that these flying squirrels had their heads cut off these juvenile as the next guy told me these juveniles. And I said, Oh, it's like juvenile detention center, right? The little, yeah, they, they, you know, not a very good joke, but you're telling me they had their heads cut off and that they kept basically carrying these, they were carrying these cages for, um, for like days on end, somehow making all this noise. Come on. So, we are at the point now where we've come out of it. I'm still a man in some respects. I'm like a technology man. You know, I'm not really a man's man, but we came out of it. We haven't heard anything upstairs. The guys came back. They checked. There was nothing more in the new newly placed cages and uh, they closed up the access point and everything's good. But what a to do that was. I mean, it was, it was craziness. And of course, then one day last week I was walking in my car and I saw a freaking black mouse run along the edge of the garage by my car. I'm like, what is going on here? Um, But the guy said, you know, don't worry about the ones in the garage. It's easy to get in and out of garages. We have the little poison traps here, so they'll eat them. And the one was eaten up quite a bit. I don't know how people are exterminators, by the way. I mean, can you imagine every day waking up and your job is to find, uh, find rodents hiding in people's attics or infesting people's attics or around their homes and just every day. I mean, you really got to have some constitution to be able to do that. But, um, yeah, so that was my, that was my to do with that. It was something else. Um, last month already, I can't believe it's last month. It was like last month, almost to the day. Um, I went to see the band Madball. Now, everybody who I told that I was going to see this band Madball, who were playing at this place called the Stanhope House, which is this old like 1800s roadhouse in Stanhope, New Jersey, which is really podunky. I mean, it's only 20 minutes from where I live way out here. It's right off of Route 80, way out here by Pass Rockaway, by uh, by kind of Mount Olive and the ITC Center. It's just in this quiet downtown, almost an 1800s little town that's been built upon. And Madball is going to be playing there. And everyone I would tell is like, I don't know what Madball is. But Madball is one of the most influential, of course, I'm saying it now to to make everyone feel like they should understand it, but they're the, one of the most influential hardcore bands ever, especially New York hardcore. These guys have been doing this for 30 years. The lead singer is only 42 because he started singing in the band when he was 12. It was kind of a joke uh, broken off from the band, was it Agnostic Front? And the singer, Freddie, his brother was uh, Roger Moret, I think in, in Agnostic Front, and Roger started this kind of side funny band where his little brother who was 12 would be the singer. Well, lo and behold, 30 years later, here they still are going. I have seen Madball over the years when I was a teenager mostly, and they've come out with album after album, and they are just a beautiful or brutiful band or of just high-level hardcore, just amazing hardcore. It's got kind of a rap feel to it. It's got the purest level of heaviness. It's got a toughness and it's legit toughness. They were New York born and bred. And uh, I think like people went to prison, you know, not that I have to justify them by saying they went to prison, but they are a legit hardcore band. And every time I listen to this band, I am just, I love it. I love everything about them. One of my favorite albums of all time is Look My Way. And that was one of their albums around 2000 or late 90s. It's just so fresh and it's so heavy. You can understand what he's saying. He's got kind of a, uh, a, a, a hip hop vibe to his singing, but he's got also just a brutal raspiness. They are phenomenal and they got a great groove to the rhythm section and the guitar is just all out heavy. And they got some kind of, they, they'll have some sort of 311 ish feels to some of the riffs and the sliding and all that. They're so good. And look, I'd lost touch with them on their albums that have come out and all that. And it's crazy when you realize how much touch you've lost, 
Yeah, how much yeah, touch you've lost. When you look at when albums came out and you're like, oh my God, the last one I paid attention to came out in 2004. It's 14 years later. And these guys just keep going. But anyway, I follow them on Instagram and I saw this little flyer go out and it said they were going to be playing in Stanhope, New Jersey. And then they were playing in all normal cities after that. Because Stanhope is, that sticks out like a sore thumb when you see it. The Stanhope House in Stanhope, New Jersey. You know, they're playing Richmond, Charlotte. They're playing real cities after that. Chapel Hill. Um, They're going to festivals, all this. And I was like, look, I got to go to this. This is a Thursday night in April. But I got to go to this. And I tried to get people to go. And no one would go with me. I mean, it was crazy. It 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 was making me almost nuts that this band is playing basically in my backyard and nobody's coming but i just resigned my fact i'm going so i got my tickets and my wife was like yep you can go it's so important to go to things for yourself and your own personal uh evolution and 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 uh and and you know creating a better position for yourself in this time where you have a family and you have a wife and you have all of these responsibilities um the personal evolution is just so important to still do things for yourself, like going to movies, even which I've done. I went to see Avengers infinity war yesterday in town, but all these things are important. You know, otherwise what's living, what's living, just coming home, going to work, coming home, going to work, coming home, going to work, having a couple drinks, eating dinner. Uh, then the weekend is another form of work where you're going from disappointment to disappointment for your kid and this, like, it's good to do things that take you back to the time when you had time and you had the world at your beck and call and you could do what you wanted at any one moment. Now it's okay to lose that aspect as you get older, but it's, it's, it's important to not lose it completely. You need a little of that still going. You need to, you need to keep the fire burning, um, for, uh, you know, kind of that, the things that that give you meaning personally that don't necessarily give you meaning interpersonally with others, but the things that are important to you to find a way to do. And my wife said, it's okay. You can go do it. She actually ended up going out with her friends that night, like five minutes from where I was. And I was like, Oh, you should come to the concert. But it's, you know, we're talking legit hardcore. Like I would be weirded out. My wife showing up to a hardcore show and seeing who I truly was because it's craziness. You know, it's like insanity. It's not quite like, you know, anal cunt <laughs> metal, like those crazy names, but, uh, it's, it's hardcore. It's legit. And it's crazy mosh pits and slam dancing and all that, but I love it. And I'm just, I, I couldn't believe they were playing in a couple of towns over from me. So I went there, I went to a place called salt just beforehand by myself, went to the bar, got a couple of uh, craft beers and a burger. And it was funny because the lead singer of black 47 i think which was an old famous irish band he was going to be performing at this place that night it's so weird like you can find a good time anywhere if you look hard enough like i went in the same town almost and i did yoga with one of the lead singers of uh youth of today or that one of the with the lead singer of one of the biggest bands in hardcore other new york hardcore band he was a yoga instructor he's become this unbelievably sought after international yogi and I did yoga with him that day in that town. And so you can find things to do that are right in your backyard. You don't have to go to New York City or the nearest big city. You just got to look. You got to pay attention. You got to keep your eyes out for when people are around. But things happen. So I go from this place and the lead singer of Black 47 was going to be performing. Then I drive down the road to this quiet little road behind this place called Bell's Mansion, which I've it's a high level uh, restaurant. <laughs> like the Stanhope House is kind of behind it. And I went there and there was like no one in this place. And what I realized was that Madball must have uh, uh, some kind of personal relationship with somebody who runs the Stanhope house or somebody in their crew does. Listen to me dropping the word crew. Um, And so as a favor or maybe they were getting really good money to do it, they went all the way out on Route 80 to the Stanhope house to kind of kick off their tour. So in some ways, I think it was sort of a... Uh, like a rehearsal show in front of real people, but they were going to be doing this big festival the next day and then kicking off their tour. So I think they did it here as a way to kind of uh, knock the cobwebs off uh, and, and get like a rehearsal in a way or a practice in front of people. But they put on their show and it was great. But I'm standing there and I'm like, oh my God, I'm at a show again. It's probably been a decade since I've gone to a show, maybe 15 years since I've gone to a show. But it was the same old feel, you know, you're out there, you're on the you're on the floor, you're clapping for the opening bands who stink, who are just awful, and you're sitting there going, "What is their influence? What like what are they playing right now?" Bizarre riffs, like weird blast beats and it just 
you don't even know what the people are playing and you're like what is your inspiration because you're trying to you're trying to copy some band that must do this well although i can't imagine any band doing this well um you know i'm not trying to shit on these kind of people doing their craft but not very good and then you get closer to the band the main bands and there was a good opener who's sort of a uh i think they were called like um strength through strength through silence or something and they were good they're like a band from Bergen county new jersey who uh or silence before death that's what it was and they're they're, they're like a, a bane type hardcore band kind of up my alley i like it that fast hardcore with octaves and nice breakdowns and all that with the singer who kind of sounds like a kid yelling um but they're like a bergen county band who have day jobs and they do these kind of uh weekend tours or they'll do shows that are close by where they live they were pretty decent so i found them through this show and then madball came on and it was fantastic now it's crazy i it's been so long since i've been at a show that like i didn't know what you're supposed to do like i felt like etiquette you shouldn't look at your phone like you normally would because it just feels like a, an insult to the people on the stage the other crazy thing is the amount of like videos people are taking of the bands playing now i know that's to be expected but it's just it's funny like you're not engaged in the moment and i was doing it too because you want to take the video put it on instagram prove to people you were there in some ways but uh it was tremendous and it's funny because when i took the video the sound on my video was actually better than I remember the sound in the facility. Um, but it was really cool. It was so great to see this band and just, they just keep at it. It's amazing. These kind of middle class bands who are just road warriors who aren't making a ton of money. And you think of Madball, they actually were on a major label at one point. And you look at the other end of that where you're not on a major label anymore and you're just kind of huffing it and you're out on the road just trying to make enough to get by to keep the passion alive. But man, 30 years doing something and probably 25 or 20 years at the levels of of an everyday uh, job type of band. I mean, it was it was something else, but it was nice to reacquaint myself with their with their catalog again too just to listen to it all to find some new songs i hadn't heard they actually have a new album apparently coming out in june so in about a month so i'm looking forward to that um but i was bummed that i couldn't find anyone to go with me again though trying to do things by myself again is important i'm actually meeting up with an old friend next week on uh, friday when i went to the phil murphy uh gov- gubernatorial inauguration ball which was at metlife stadium I was in one of the rooms there and I heard someone say, oh, hey, Matt, Matt McQueen. And I looked around and I'm like, oh, hey. And he looked familiar as someone can who you haven't seen in 30 years. Uh, well, not 30, maybe 25 uh, since the time Manball's been playing. <laughs> um, but I, I, this guy and I'm like, oh, and he's like, oh, Jason Wyman. I went, oh, J- Jason Wyman. Yeah. And so this guy was very um, ever present in my life at one point when I was maybe in fourth through sixth grade maybe third through sixth grade. And I would go to this house in Bergenfield, New Jersey after school every day. It was, uh, it was the babysitter, uh, who was named Marianne and she had three kids. And so those three kids, cause I'm at their house after school, they ended up being like really good friends of mine at that point in life. And, uh, like every day you're hanging out, ended up doing sleepovers and stuff. And the one guy, Jason was about a year older than me. He just turned 37 actually a couple days ago as I can see on Facebook now that we're friends. And um, so he was there at this ball because one of his best friends was running the transition. And it's like, what a small world. And then I'm talking to him and it turns out he literally lives eight minutes away from where I live. And I've talked about the fact I live in the middle of nowhere. Well, he lives in the middle of nowhere too. And he's from Bergen County too. He's right down the road. And so we'd kind of been talking, we made some Facebook friendships and then you say, Hey, let's get together at some point. It's like, Oh yeah, let's get together at some point. And then months go by. Uh, he ended up having a second child. He has a kid who's about the age of Liam, about three and a half, I'd say. And then he just had another child, um, a couple of months ago now. And so you lose touch there because everyone has their, their responsibilities and everything. But then last week I just said, you know what? I'm going to, uh, I'm going to reach out to him. I'm going to reach out to him on Facebook and just say, Hey, let's get together. Let's push the, let's push the envelope here. Let's make it happen. And so he said next Friday, so we're going to go to a local bar here, get together, maybe create something, uh, more lasting where you can have kind of a guy, you can just be like on a minute's notice. Cause he's only eight minutes down the road. Be like, Hey, you want to go get a, go get a beer or something, 
go get a drink, go, you know, get some talking on. Uh, because the one thing I live in a dream place for me and my family, but when you're in the middle of nowhere, you sort of can lose touch with, uh, with a lot of outside relationships because you're so far from everybody. And then when you have the kid and you have the responsibilities with the family and all that, you just don't get out anymore. I mean, even if I were single living out here, it would be hard to get out much to be with people who are, everybody's like 45 minutes away, no matter who you're talking to. Everybody is far away, but this guy's eight minutes away. It's almost like it's meant to be. There's some synchronicity there. So we're going to get together, try to, uh, my wife's behind it. She's saying it's good. So, uh, you know, personal growth. It's going to be, it's going to be a nice thing to try to rebuild some relationships that are 30, you know, 25 years, um, in the making. I also went to see the Avengers infinity war yesterday. As I said, I'm not big into these Marvel movies, but this one, for some reason with my movie pass thing and wanting to use that. And, uh, I would not necessarily just go to see Avengers, but since I have that movie pass, it's like, well, I can go see it. It was playing in my local, town theater here in Sparta. So I was like, I'm going to go do that. Of course I was a little late. So I was sitting in the first row. That's not the best movie to see sitting in the first row, but it's funny, this little theater, it's got the normal size, um, screen movie screen, but it's got like 12 rows of, uh, of seats. So it's like a living room theater, like a personal theater. I liked it. Uh, it was easy to keep up on what the storyline was. The, uh, the amount of actors in this movie are just it's unreal how many people are in it. It's just like an all-star game. It's like an NBA all-star game, but like 15 years worth of all-star games in one all-star game. Just everybody and their mother is in this movie. Every major actor, even Peter Dinklage is in this movie and he plays a giant, which is kind of funny. He's every, he's bigger than everyone. I don't know if it's kind of making fun of him, but he got a good payday. I was looking up on this movie too. Like Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man makes like 40 or $50 million every time he appears as Iron Man in a movie, whether it's a feature movie or whether it's a, an ensemble cast like the Avengers, $50 million. No wonder he keeps playing it and he plays it so kind of calm and loose and he's at ease with the character. It's a little cheesy with the repartee sometimes, but man, I'd do it. $50 million. Never stop putting on that Iron Man suit, Robert Downey Jr. It's unreal, Um, but it's good. You know, I think I'm going to try to pick up, there's like 13 movies in this in this Marvel universe that is the Avengers. And, uh, I saw a lot of them popping up on my Google, uh, or my YouTube TV. So I was saving them all. I started watching the original Avengers last night. I don't know. I'm trying, I'm trying to do it just to be up to date on the zeitgeist and what people are talking about. I'm starting to understand the memes now after seeing the infinity war yesterday with the people disappearing and all the memes tied to that and who Thanos is and what the stones are. So, it was, uh, it, it was good, but it was like two, two hours, 40 minutes. And it's funny, this little theater, it was weird because it's so tiny that it's almost like you're just with friends in your own, again, your own like personal theater in your home. So it's not that normal vast theater room where people kind of have manners and keep to themselves. So if a major character looks like they're about to die, like people will gasp at high levels. And then some woman just yells, she's like, will you shut up? It's all fake. And you're just like, okay, all right. But then when the movie ended, um, nobody was getting up and I could sense it. Like two people got up who aren't in the know, I guess. And I'm just sitting there cause I'm like, why are people not getting up? So I quickly opened my phone and I said, uh, I did Avengers post credits. And then I got into the whole thread about why you're supposed to stay because there's often encore scenes or post credit scenes that give you, um, that give you a view into what's coming or a little more information, you know, almost like coming attractions in a way. And uh, apparently uh, older Avengers movies or previous Avengers movies would have several layers of credit post credit scenes. This one ended up being one, but I understood why people stayed, but it was weird. Cause it was like, you got a sense you're supposed to stay and the credits, because for a movie like this, how much money it's made, how much CGI, how many worlds there are to build, um, the credits go on forever. It's like 10 minutes. And when I saw this movie it was two hours and 42 minutes, it didn't make much sense to me because I'm like watching it. And I'm like, how is there still like 35 minutes left? But it turns out you got the credits that counts towards it. And then the post scene. And I did end up getting home earlier than I thought, but, um, yeah, how many people are in that movie is just crazy. So I got back home and my wife went out to a symphony concert with her mom in Newark. So it was just going to be me and Liam. 
we went down to five guys, about 25 minutes, 20, 25 minutes away from our house. Got Liam something to eat there. Got him a little mini burger and then got myself a burger for later because I wasn't going to eat there. And uh, and some fries. I sh- never get the large fries at Five Guys. Like the mini fries are enough to feed a family or enough to feed a, an Ethiopian village, to be honest. But they're enough to feed more than enough, the small one. And I was like, oh, you know what? Liam's going to have some and then I'm going to have mine. Let me get the large. So just in what was left in the bag from the overage, which is something I like with Five Guys, it's sort of like when you go get a milkshake at an old style milkshake place, uh, or even Friendly's might do this too. They give you the milkshake and then they give you the little um, metal tin, and then like what's left over in the metal middle, or sorry, the metal tin is like the amount of another full milkshake. I always like that, and there's the same kind of feel with the overflow with the fries at Five Guys. Um, just with what was in the overflow was able to feed Liam and was able to more than enough feed me later. So I still have the enormous fry thing left. It's crazy. But I, uh, he was looking around after he was eating about half his burger and he's like, I want ice cream. Cause he saw people with the shakes. That's one thing I don't get with like a place like five guys. There's almost this 1950s ideal about the, the old like dinette, right? Where you go out to the, uh, you go out to the local, a uh, diner place and you get your burger and your shake and like people are eating milk sh- or burgers and milkshakes as their drink while they're eating and it's crazy how like those kind of things can be uh built into the popular imagination where you do them without thinking about it like what a crazy thought to eat a cheeseburger and to have a milkshake with it at the exact same time. That's got to be like 200 grams of fat. It's so unhealthy, but because it's done and because there's a nostalgic ideal about doing it, people just do it. And it's like, oh my God, like you're not going to eat for a week, but then people eat anyway. They go to like, you know, get eggs and pancakes the next day on top of it probably. Well, I shouldn't speak for them, but like I'm looking around, I'm like, oh my God, the amount of people just having a shake, like it's their drink with this is weird. It's like a weird mix of tastes too. Like it doesn't seem right. Um, or it seems so right that it's, it shouldn't seem so right, but it tastes so good because a milkshake that's that level with a bur you know, it's weird. And then the fact that you can get bacon into the milkshakes, which is a thing there too. Whoa. But anyway, he saw this milk, he saw this ice cream. I said, Oh, you want a shake? And so I got him a shake, vanilla milkshake with like chocolate syrup and then chocolate or something, chocolate pieces. And man, I would pay to have that look on the face. I think that was the first time he's ever had a milkshake. The look on his face of just pure, unadulterated joy on the one sip was like, oh my God, I can't believe what I just did. I can't believe how good that tastes. And so little me, I was like, I'm not going to buy myself a shake because I get really neurotic about eating in this sense. So if I'm having a burger and the fries, like that's really filling. And I'm thinking about the fat content in a burger with the cheese and how much it is. And then when you add a milkshake to it, it gets out of control. And so I would never just get a milkshake. And plus, I'm going to have wine with my burger um, when I should have beer, but I'm going to have wine with my burger. And you just, I don't know, the thought of the cascading food and just, it, it probably goes down fine, but it doesn't feel right. So I'm, uh, I get his. And a little kid like that, three and a half year old, as much as he's able to drink, there's still like 80% of the shake left. So I'm like, okay, well, if I didn't get this for myself, I can always have it later if I'm feeling it. And the beauty, the beauty of drinking wine is you can feel it easy because the wine takes all your inhibitions down and then you're just sitting there like, yeah, sure. So anyway, we got him a shake. We got home. We got into our car on the way home. I had to stop at the liquor store and get myself a boxed wine. (laughs) Why do I get box? Because I don't want to open up a bottle of wine for myself. It just doesn't feel right. So you open up a box. You have like two to three glasses. You're not even noticing really. Have my burger. I had my. I was in the dining room and I had my iPad set up right in front of me. And I'm just in in just pure heaven eating these five guys double burger. The fries are so good with that peanut taste. And uh, my wine. And I got my TV on and I'm watching. Well, sadly, I was watching the Mets lose watching a bit of the uh, LeBron James Cleveland Cavaliers first home game against Toronto in that series, which they ended up winning in dramatic fashion and pretty much putting away this Toronto team probably for good. I can't imagine that there's not going to be moves made after this season that uh, 
irrevocably change the core of this team. It's going to happen. There's just no way it's not. And so I'm watching that. And then I was like, you know, I'm like two or three glasses of wine. in. so I'm like, yeah, I'll start watching the Avengers. I don't know if I picked up a moment of the hour and 10 minutes I watched because it just, but I don't even know what the Avengers, if you have to pick anything up, it's all pretty obvious what's going on. It's fight to fight. This person's bad. This person's good. You never know what Sam Jackson is, but he is what he is. And so I'm doing that. And then I reached the point where I was like, you know what? I could totally fit a little milkshake in here now. So I went into that outside fridge where I saw the mouse go by the week before and I pulled out that little shake. Oh my God. It was, that was, I felt like Liam with the smile when I had that taste. I ate, I had that whole thing in like three minutes. So maybe a milkshake does go down pretty easy. It's just so good. And, uh, I felt bad cause this morning he was asking about it and he's like, can we get it from the freezer? I'll have it. I'm like, mm. no, I think it melted. I think it melted actually. Cause I didn't even want to tell him I took it. Um, but that was good. It's just good. As good as it is to be with people, it's good to be by yourself too. You get a lot of personal development going on. Uh, you can think you can contemplate and, uh, it makes you a better person on the other end when you are with people. A couple of kind of quick, uh, tech things going on here. I didn't realize this, but Apple bought Texture. Do you know Texture? So Texture is that uh, application, and it used to be called Next Issue. It was probably called something before that, but it's sort of a Netflix of magazines. So you pay one monthly price, call it $15, call it $10 if there's a deal, maybe call it a little less if there's some even deeper deal, and you have access to a pretty solid amount of unlimited magazines within this one app interface. So, you know, you have men's health, you have time, you have sports illustrated, you have the New Yorker. Uh, they added the Atlantic. There's a lot. I mean, and it's just unlimited how many you can get a nice user experience. It ends up being too much for me because I can barely get through my New Yorker. Um, and then my economist in a week, it's just hard enough. And then when I had the amount of magazines and texture, your, your feet, you're kind of weighed down by the magazines you're not reading that you're paying for. And it just became too much. And you can find great deals on certain magazines you like anyway. Like I'm paying $2 a year for Sports Illustrated. I'm paying 50 a year for The New Yorker. And by the time you add up the ones you really want to read, it was less than I would be paying for texture without the kind of psychological um, weight of knowing what you're not reading. And so... Um, it's, it's a great app though. It really is. And I didn't realize Apple actually bought them because Apple plans to create a new subscription service, probably almost wholeheartedly on the back of texture. So they'll probably have their own app branded in Apple and it'll probably be just like texture. Now the big key is, do they drive the price down so much on the subscription that it makes opting into subscribing to it? Um, so alluring that, uh, you have to do it. Like if it's five or six dollars a month to get access to all these, then you're in the money. I have a feeling it's going to be about ten because that sort of is the is the line of decar- demarcation for a lot of these subscription services like Apple Music. Um, Netflix has bumped up now, uh, but a lot of these kind of all you can eat services in their different realms ends up being around ten. Not the cable TV stuff like YouTube TV or Fubo or um, Sling. Like those end up being twenty five to thirty five or even forty. But a lot of these kind of magazines, music, ten is sort of the level where you just go, all right, that might be it. I'm not going to think that hard about subscribing to it. But I'm really interested to see what they uh, what they do with that because the Apple user experience can look really good. And, uh, I think it'll be something that will, will be very nice because texture was nice. I don't think texture was doing very well though. I think they built a great product that made them conducive to be bought by a company like Apple, but we'll have to see what Apple would do with that because, um, Apple is really starting to be reliant on subscription money. They know that the well is not dry in any respect about the purchase of hardware when you're talking iPhones. I mean, it is for iPads, um, but they have a lot of hardware products when you're thinking about the iPhone, the iPad, the Apple TV, the Apple Watch, the uh, the AirPods, the um, MacBooks, the all those. Like That's where they've made their money hand over fist is on the selling of hardware. And then the software services are the ones where you can make a lot of recurring money. 
um, because people are just paying into something that they're getting uh, every day, but they pay on a monthly basis. And that is nice money, nice, solid recurring revenue to get. And so they're building that up because how much more hardware can we continue to buy? There's not even the feeling really for people to buy new iPhones like there used to be. And there shouldn't be. I mean, how often do you really need to get a new iPhone? I'm a crazy tech person. And because of the incentives uh, of the programs I'm in, I can get a new one every year. I'm in one of these programs where you basically pay the phone off within a year. So you're able to re up into a new one and actually doesn't pay to keep holding the phone you have. Like you, you, you start to actually pay out more, uh, in terms of, uh, what Apple's getting your, your, or your, your cell phone provider. Uh, you're actually almost, the phone's paid off, so you might as well jump to a new one. I mean, it's one of the parts that makes sense. But in this time of conservation and environmental health and all this, like hardware, uh, more and more hardware, like you, you know, these stones are taken out of the earth and these um, elements are taken out of the earth to then build phones with it for us then to just turn these phones back into the earth, right? Because they go back to landfills and all this stuff where they're recycled to be sold to third, uh, not third worlds, but second markets. And it's just, it's silly. So really there's kind of a shift to software um, because software is recurring. It's digital. It's not hardware. Um, it's user intuitive. It's something people are interacting with day after day. And it's pixels, right? I mean, it's not real world product. And Apple is sort of seeing a, uh, a mixing over to that because uh, they need to make more from their software services. And I'll tell you, with Apple Music, they just hit 40 million paid subscribers, which is up 11% from two months earlier. This might even be a little older. They might be jumping up even more. Now, Spotify, when you think of them being the name for really streaming music, they're what people think. Just like search engines, people think Google. Just like tissues, people think Kleenex, right? They're those eponymous stuff. It's what we think. Spotify is uh, streaming music. It's what we all think. And they're at 73 million paid users. Now, they have double that in terms of people who use the free tiers and all that. But we're talking people who put money up to, uh, to, to pay for something on a monthly basis. And Apple is, all, is more than halfway there already. And they've done it quietly. They really have had some advertising going on up there. But having their three-month trial gives people a good chance to really test drive the thing. It's got great integrations with anybody who's in the Apple ecosystem between your iPads and your iPhones and your Apple Watch especially, which is the last place um, or which is the only place that you can store music is through Apple Music on the Apple Watch. Um, and you can stream it obviously over the new Apple, uh, the, the third generation Apple Watch with the LTE. Um, but it's the only place you can store on the watch. So for those people who want to go running out into the world without a phone and they want to listen to their music, Apple Music makes a lot of sense. Plus, if you're able to get a student plan, they have a four ninety nine. I'm still able to get that with my NYU email address, which I've kept current all these years. So 40 million paid subscribers is pretty tremendous. You think about people maybe getting that HomePod speaker. That's the only service that can be on that speaker is Apple Music. Now, I don't think that has sold very well, but it's there. Um, and a lot of times you can Bluetooth things from it. So it makes a lot of sense on an Apple device. Uh, it's, it's very good for that. Um, but Spotify, 73 million, you know, I mean, that's, that's still a heck of a lot of money. Spotify is a publicly traded company now, so they're going to have to deal with the whims and vagaries of the market. Uh, but it's very good. I will tell you, I've gone from Apple music to Google music and I've heard Google music is actually going to go away. Google play music and be, um, uh, subsumed into some newly created app that Google's going to come out with called Remix or something, which means to me that Google Play Music is not really moving the needle for Google. If they need to come up with services that get people to want to uh, to get into their app, it means that w the one that's there now is not working very well. And I have to tell you, I think it's a tremendous app. It allows you to take all of your library you already had, upload it into the Google Cloud, up to 50,000 songs, and then it allows, it's got a beautiful interface, much like the YouTube TV, same company. And it gets, it gives you all, everything you need from the new music. It's got the playlists in it because it bought a company a couple of years ago called Songzia, I think. And so there, it's a great service, but I guess it wasn't doing well. So Google's trying to pivot to another service to try to get more user uptake. Um, but anyway, I jumped from that recently over to back to Spotify. 
Why? Because Spotify has this great bundle deal that they came out with. First, they came out with it to students sometime in the last year. And that was the one I really wanted to jump on because it's only $5 a month and you get full access to Spotify, the paid membership, and you get Hulu. Now, the Hulu with ads, but you know, at $5 a month, that's a tremendous value. Now, when I tried to sign up for Spotify under the student provision, it just would not let me. It would not authenticate me. Apple has a little bit more of a forgiving uh, student membership um company they use called Unidays. I was able to fly through that with a, with ease, really without having to do anything, have to show any paperwork. Um, so I couldn't jump to the Spotify deal at the $5 and that was the only one that had the bundle with the two. Uh, it came out last month, I think, or maybe two months ago, I'm losing track with my time, but it came out recently that they were, uh, m- they were moving this plan from only students to everybody. And so for $12 a month, it might even be like $11 a month for the first three and then maybe $12 a month from there on out, you can get that same plan. You get all Spotify and you get Hulu with ads. So the with ads kind of stinks, but the price of that is a really good savings. And then when you add that to having YouTube TV and then if I can eventually cut my cable, I'm at a really good place. And Spotify is still a very good service. It's it's almost become a victim of its own success where having Spotify doesn't feel cool at this point. Like Spotify was so cool early. Spotify was almost like the band with the demo who was on the, uh, who were the up and comers. And you loved the band when they were doing demos and when they were still not known. And then they became a major label band and then everybody knew them and they felt lesser than at that point for you. And that's kind of how I feel with Spotify. They've been on the scene now for so long in relative years in this service, and they were the up and comer and initially getting it, it was like life changing because no one had it. It felt like uh, it felt like one of these almost torrent sites, but it was legal and it was allowed. And it was so cool to just be able to have like an iTunes with everything at your disposal. Now everyone does it and now it doesn't feel so special. And now we're at the point where Spotify is a public company and they've been at it the longest in some ways. And, uh, it just doesn't feel as cool, but it's a great service. And at this deal I can get with the, with the Hulu, it's tremendous because, um, Spotify works on everything. It obviously works on my iPhone, on my iPads, and then it's got dedicated, uh, third-party integrations with the different Amazon Echoes uh, uh, speakers I have in my house, and then with my YouTube, uh, not my YouTube, my Google Home speaker, it locks into every single service, whereas the other ones will work on some and not work on others or only works on this. And so I kind of liked that aspect where you could always have a service that's ported on all of your devices and speakers. And so I ended up doing that. Um, But then I'm really thinking to myself, why do I even subscribe to a service when I'm only using it to access songs I already have somewhere digitally too? Like I end up just listening to the same great songs I loved from the past. Like I'm listening to Madball or I'm listening to bands I already have. And then when I go to create, you know, when I go to follow all the artists, I'm just adding it to the mix uh, of my Spotify And like, shouldn't I just maybe have my music I already own available somewhere? Although that's become uh, increasingly tougher because then you almost have to pay like iTunes match to like, you have to pay money to actually be able to access the music. I mean, it's weird, but I mean, maybe I could just keep the Google thing and have my music, but I really don't add much music to the mix. I don't care for new music. I'm not finding new music in a lot of the services or in a lot of the bands I love, the kind of music I love. I like to just listen to what I liked 20 years ago. And so I'm paying Spotify for the right to listen to the songs I already have. I don't know if that's the best deal. And then even if I'm going to say, oh, I'll listen to Spotify's top 50, right? The top 50 right now. Well, I could do that on Pandora. Or I think I could do it on Spotify for free anyway without having to pay for it. So you sort of play in your head with why am I paying for something? Should I be paying for something? Am I really getting the use out of it? Can I get the use out of it for free? I mean, I don't know if this is still the case, but I used to just play Spotify on my iPad because on the iPad, you have full access to Spotify, but just with ads. On the mobile device, on the phone, you can only hit shuffle all the time. So you can't pick really what you want to listen to. You can shuffle and that's it. That's the only command you can do. So you can go to an artist and shuffle. You can go to an album and shuffle. You can go to a playlist and shuffle, but you can't say, I want to play this song or I want to play this album from top to bottom. Um, But on the iPad, 
you can. It's just you have some ads popping in sometimes. So I don't even know. And then you're sitting there going, it's only $10 a month. Is it really that big a deal? And now I'm getting my Hulu. So I guess that was the, uh, that was the big, um, that was the big mix, uh, for me. That's where I'm, that's where I'm dealing with. Um, yeah, why don't we call it there? Good episode guys. It was nice to get back on the, uh, on the saddle, get back talking to you, get another hour in the books get a lot of these notes I have in front of me cleared so I don't have to worry about them and I can restart my new notebook with all my new thoughts, which are all the same thoughts, but what are you going to do? Thanks, folks. Love you. I will talk to you very soon.